So let's get started, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, hope you're enjoying the first day of, uh, or the first full day of uh, reInvent. I know this is maybe the last session of the day for some of you, and it's been a very early start in the keynote, getting everybody in there this morning. Uh, so I appreciate you coming along. Uh, today we'll be talking about the 3D rendering on Amazon EC2. And we'll be talking about that through the story of AWS customer Zero Light, who are really trying to digitize and revolutionize the car buying experience for uh, automotive manufacturers. So I'll be popping back up on, uh, on stage in a while. Um, firstly, uh, Francois from Zero Light will be taking you through uh, the story of Zero Light and how they use AWS. I'll come back on a bit later to talk about some of the services uh, they use of AWS's. Um, just for quick introductions, uh, I'm Steve Bryan, a Solutions Architect uh, Manager in the UK for AWS. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to Francois to talk about their story, and I'll talk to you guys in a minute. Thank you, Steve. So, hello everyone. I'm Francois de Bodin. I'm the CMO of Zero Light. Who is Zero Light? Uh, because we all know Amazon, but maybe we don't know Zero Light yet. Uh, Zero Light is a software tech company. We use 3D visualization real time. So we've created a platform uh, to change the way people explore, configure, experience, and even buy cars. So we specialize in automotive. So the first thing I want to do, since we are focusing on visualization, is to show you a video. Probably some of you saw that video yesterday during uh, the keynote from Terry Wise. But this video has a little surprise at the end that was not in the keynote. Then I walk you through the story of you know, the behind the scenes of this video. Wouldn't it be great if the car could be brought to life to explore, configure, and interact with in stunning detail to any device from anywhere with amazing results. And what if I could just ask for it? Alexa. Hello. Can I have it in red? Done. Show me in green. How's that? Open the doors. Opening. Thanks, Alexa. Close the doors. Closing. Let's take it for a drive. Started driving. So this is not an announcement today, but uh, I will show you a bit where things are going. So the first, the first thing today, uh, we talk about technology a lot, but I think to have a successful product and uh, a good experience, you need two things. You need technology and you need a good timing. And timing is very key as well for uh, the demand from customers. So are we using the technology the right way at the right time? So the first thing I want to do is show you a little bit why we're doing what we do at Zero Light and why this is now the perfect timing to, uh, to use those technology. The first thing is that talking about dealership and buying cars, in the US over the past 10 years, people used to go to dealership five times. Now they go 1.3 to 1.6 times on average. They don't go to dealerships anymore. And there are several reasons for that. One of the reasons is that with the car being personalized, you used to go to dealership to see the car you were going to buy. And now there are so many different options on the car that when you go to dealership, you just don't see the car. So the only way you can see the car before you buy it is to digitize the content and to have a car in 3D. The second reason is also the location of the dealership. They're mostly outside the city, they're in the suburbs, and uh, people don't really spend their Sunday uh, with their family going to dealership and, and, uh, and their kids and uh, even the dog. What dealerships are doing now, they're creating digital showroom uh, in the city center where you have a higher footfall and more people there. So it's a brand uh, initiative. And when you have more people uh, in the city centers, you have more touch points and more opportunities to, uh, 
uh, to create contact with the customer, but you have less room. So hence the uh, necessity to digitize your content and create new experience. So if the people are not at the dealership or less at the dealership, well, obviously, I think you, you, you found out they're online. And it turns out that 97%, 96% actually, of the people search online before they buy the car. So on the three months customer journey, you know, when you're in market to buy a car, you spend on average three quarters of your time online to research the car. So the discovery phase has moved from the dealership to the online. So when you go to dealership, you know more about the car than the sales guy himself. What you see as well is that people are all, all, also more and more willing to completely bypass the dealership and buy the car online. You see that in China very much, and in the US more and more. Actually, the prediction are showing that by 2025, one quarter of the cars will be sold online directly. And you have many proof of that behavior. Just look at what happened the past few years. You see many things, and you see more and more. If you extend this towards 2017, you're going to see a lot of announcement for many OEM and also new players. Even Amazon is selling cars now. They're selling Seat in France. They're selling Fiat in Italy. They're selling BMW in Japan. You can buy a car on Amazon. So this is really uh, creating a need to have an online experience that is uh, valuable and, and uh, able to, uh, to help your customer. But again, yet today, when you go online, if you go buy a pair of Nike trainers, like here, you are used to a nice visualization where you can customize your, your shoe yourself. And here you have 3D, and you can choose through millions of different Nike combinations. It's the same thing for other brands like Adidas as well. And what you find out is that people, they transfer their experience uh, to other industries. So they expect the same level of experience even if they move to another industry. And you see that this is the Apple effect, okay? The Apple store, where people have an experience where they touch the product, they can play with the product, and they don't have the pressure of the sales guy. They just have a product expert next to them coming and saying, can I help you? And, and the experience is much more valuable and uh, smooth for the customer. And yet in the uh, car industry, so I took an Audi website here because uh, we are partner with Audi and they were kind enough to, to uh, give us a bit their older version of the website where 2D based, okay, before, uh, before we move to 3D. But it's the same for every uh, automaker. What you have usually is you click on the 2D pictures and you see uh, you can change your color and you have a, a few predefined views of the car. And that's it. You have actually more views on the Nike than on, uh, on the website for the car. So people, when they buy a car, we think that they deserve a better experience. And that's why we are doing what we do. So all this is telling us that we are moving from a dealership-centric approach where the goal of the brand, the OEM, was to bring the customer to the dealership and saying, you're going to go there, and once you're there, you're going to see the product, and then we're done. The deal is done. It's not like that anymore. You have, for people to go to dealership, you have to convince them upstream before with a good experience. And that's what we call the uh, customer-centric approach. It's the brand's role and mission now to follow the customer wherever he is at each and every touch point and provide the good experience. So when we say each and every touch point, it could be TV, it could be you know, uh, gaming, it could be mobile VR, it could be VR, it could be tablet, it could be PC, desktop, you name it, okay? Every single touch point, we have to be there. So that's the context. I think that's important to note that the timing today in automotive is right to change the way we buy cars. When you're going to spend 25, 30K on a car, or more, or a bit less, and you received, you know, uh, your experience at the, the, the dealership is not that great, it's, it's a bit deceiving, okay? So you, you, need, you need this better experience. Imagine how you would be received in a luxury store if you would call them and say, look, I'm going to come and spend 25K in your store. You're going to be a king there. Why are we not a king in the dealership? So we need a better experience. We need to have something memorable. And that's what we're doing. So online, how did we reinvent 
the uh, configurator experience. Today experience, so I'm going to talk about Audi here. Experience today, I resume it in a, on the customer point of view uh, in, in those boxes. Static images, limited number of views, limited number of environment. Usually the car is in a wide studio. Uh, the car doesn't move uh, and, and the customer is not in control of the experience. It's just the brand website that gives you a few pictures and, and you have to follow, follow what they want. So the goal of Zero Light working with AWS is to change that experience and, and revert all those features and all those weaknesses into strength. Bring the car anywhere, in any environment. Make it move, open the door, make it turn on the light of the car, experience the car, and make sure that the customer is in control of his experience. And I'm gonna show you how it looks like now on the, on the real Audi website. If you go to Audi.d and all the A4 cars, this is what you're gonna see. the end of the videos, when you start downloading the picture, it's actually real also. It's, you can go on the RD website, you configure, you choose the angle you want, and then you download the picture. And you have your picture. The brand is not telling you which picture you should like. You define the one you want. And so the result, we did a pilot earlier this year with Audi. Uh, it was a 100 days pilot. Um, so we are working on deploying to more and more cars. This pilot was just on one car, the A4 or Road, over 100 days. And uh, in white, you have the 2D basic configurator, okay? And in yellow, or uh, orange here, you have the uh, 3D configurator. So on a few uh, KPIs such as interaction, involvement, safety, and things like this, you see that every single thing Audi people measured were higher, which is a bit to be expected. It's nice, but that's not how, and that's not the main reason you should do it as a brand. And again, for automotive or other industries, whether it's architecture, fashion, uh, white goods, anything that you can customize or visualize a product, you could use that. One very interesting result is that, first of all, you had an increase in configuration in 3D compared to 2D. So more people were configuring. So you were creating more value there. You had also 66% more interaction in 3D versus 2D, which is again there to be expected because we give the control to the user. Maybe one of the most interesting uh, result is the fact that on average, the uh, basket size on the car configuration was significantly higher in 3D compared to 2D. I can't give you the number, but if you multiply this number by the number of configuration and car you buy for a brand like Audi or any other brand for that matter, this is a huge ROI. It's direct bottom line on your revenue. So this has impact better than just feelings or experience. This is actual revenue. There is another very, very interesting thing. And uh, again, if you were in uh, the partner keynote yesterday with Terry Wise, there was at some point a uh, gentleman called James Hamilton who talked about data and uh, his boat and it was a very compelling uh, 
discussion where he was explaining that his boat was full of capture and he was measuring everything every five minutes and he had like something taken every nine seconds. He knew everything about everything around the environment and the condition of the boat. Everything was stored on AWS. And this is the same thing here. What you see at the bottom are eight typical camera positions that you can find on the configurator. So you come as a user, you click on one of the camera, the camera will go there, and then you can go in 3D. So the thing we can measure is, so over uh, the last few weeks, uh, two, two, three months, we had 1.2 million camera changes, okay? So you could actually measure that with a front-end click on the user interface as well. This, this is like usual, uh, usual thing. What's interesting is that if you look at the second one from the left, you see that one had a lot more camera move. And the two numbers are close, but it's really a coincidence in that case. What you see is that people move that camera. So they clicked on this picture. The camera moved there. And then they moved the car a lot. And a camera move for us is uh, measured every like 100 milliseconds. Uh, we measure the camera position. So when we have a significant move in 3D, we record a camera move. And the kind of information it gives us is that when you aggregate all that in 3D, you can create and you can create some kind of a heat map that shows the OEM what are the most popular angle and the preferred angle, what we call beauty shot in automotive of the car. So now you're using, the more your user and consumer use your website and your configurator, the more data you can create and assimilate from AWS, from the cloud directly. This, you cannot get that from a front-end user interface. It has to be from the back-end in the 3D. So that was an interesting thing from this configurator. When Audi released it earlier this year, uh, they released the configurator on their website. Uh, a few weeks after, we had an article saying this was the best configurator on the internet. We didn't write that, somebody else wrote, so it was interesting to see that because it was new. And this technology that we, so this is me here, uh, obviously happy to receive an award uh, earlier this year, the Techies Award, uh, and another one actually here as well. So we received a couple of awards this year for two reasons. The first one was the, the integration with Amazon Web Services and the fact that we were able to bring a complex experience that you usually do in a dealership to the web and make it available to everyone. And this was new. One of the second reasons was how we uh, were able to go live that quickly uh, uh, this year with, uh, with, with customers and make that part of the omnichannel platform that we propose to customers. Meaning that once a customer like Audi brings a car online like this, this is the same level of quality that the car they use in their VR experience or in a 4K screen in their Audi cities. So they don't have to create a new car model. And that's key for a company like Audi or other OEMs to have one master model that contains all the changes, all the options. So when you update this model, you can spread and update everything at once. We also do that in an in a automated fashion. And that's another level where when you have a change, within five days, we can propagate that change to every dealer and online at the same time. So that's pretty powerful. A second example I want to show you is a brand. It's also VW, and it's Volkswagen. They had the launch of the Tiguan in uh, Australia. I believe this page is still on. It's a three, uh, three months project just for the launch of the car. And so we did another configurator with them. I'll let the uh, video speak for, it, for itself.
One thing you might have noticed in that video is that at some points you have two screens uh, which are next to each other and you see a 2D versus 3D. And what we do is when the bandwidth doesn't allow you to stream a 3D uh, live and direct content, then we come to 2D and we use the same card to create 2D pictures on the fly. That requires less bandwidth. Do you have a problem with my thing here? Okay, no. So another example I want to show you is Pagani. So I don't know if you know Pagani. It's a supercar in, uh, manufacturer in Italy. Uh, it's a $2 million car. It's a piece of art and technology at the same time. Uh, it's really amazing design. It's all made of carbon fiber. It's a beautiful car. So what we did earlier this year, we did a demo of, I'm, I'm going to run it in the, in the background while I speak. We did a demo of a configurator, this technology, on our website. So this is not on Pagani's website. For a simple reason, is Pagani, uh, in the customer journey of Pagani, you don't configure the car on the website. You buy the car, and then configuring the car is part of the experience of buying a Pagani. Because you go to the factory, and you meet the engineer, and you choose your material, and you, you, you have a level of customization which is beyond, uh, uh, beyond every other car makers. It's infinite number of combinations. But as a demo, we wanted to show the level of quality we could reach with the Pagani uh, online. And you see here interactivity, where we can basically open the doors, close the doors. You have the shadows following. Uh, you have all type of colors. Uh, we could have an infinite number of colors, but it was a, like a quick configurator demo. What we did is we had a uh, launch with Top Gear magazine earlier this year for two weeks. We did an exclusivity before we launched that configurator. And Top Gear will, uh, will have the exclusivity on this thing. So we measure for two weeks what happened and a bit the result of the behavior of people. That's how we started measuring and coming with the idea of data mining on the configurator is uh, the way to go in the future. So you can even drive the car here online. This is all real time. So let me show you the result. It's a 10 second, 20 second video. I'll show you a bit, a few numbers on the, on the results. So we actually made a white paper on all the uh, online configurator and how we do that, that you can see on the website. But one change of configuration every 2.5, 2.4 seconds. It's, uh, it's a really a big change compared to, uh, to, to what happened before. So Pagani, for the story, they use VR now in, uh, so they use the same quality model in VR to discover the car and help their VIP and their customers uh, configure the car. So I'm going to move now for you and give you that, and I'm going to go sit quickly. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. I, I've got a few slides now to talk a bit about the technology that ZeroLight are using, the AWS services that they use, as well as a bit more of a kind of general view on 3D rendering and some of the services available from AWS. Unfortunately, I don't have any really high definition, awesomely cool looking videos. Um, I'll just have some okay looking slides, I'll, I'll call them. So um, I'll try my best to, to, to keep it kind of uh, visual. Actually, the first slide does have a video, although not, a, not, not as fancy as the other ones. So really, this is, uh, the, this is in the Audi, uh, what they call the Audi, no, what have I done here, sorry? The Audi Digital Showroom, this is in uh, Munich Airport, they call it the Audi Sphere, and this is a VR experience, so you can look around your car, this is something Zero Light do with Audi. Now, the problem with this is that there's a local machine with two graphics cards, and you need this really low latency, 20 millisecond latency, you need, you've got the car's high definition, you've got fi 5 million polygons per car, and the real problem is this is just a one-to-one -one experience. We've got one car to one user. So this is where 
uh, Zero Light came to AWS and said, well, how can we take this experience and turn it into a one-to-many experience? How can we move it online and move, move to the web? So there was a few requirements, and they're, they're, they're mostly the same requirements that the say, you're trying to get the same experience that you get from that VR experience, although not as obviously immersive, but online. So the requirements were we needed to maintain that low latency. Um, the goal wasn't quite 20 milliseconds. Um, the goal was between 200 and 400 milliseconds. It also needed to be plug-in free, so you could use it on any device, no extra software to install on the device. We also didn't want to compromise on the quality of the, of the visual. The, the car render still needed to have the same 5 million polygons. We wanted to make sure you had that same experience, that same uh, high definition in the browser that you get in the VR experience. And it needed to run on all devices. That is tablets, uh, mobiles, laptops, desktops, etc. Francois spoke about this briefly, but it also needed to uh, run in multiple uh, bandwidths as well. So this is the 2D on-demand feature that Zero Light have implemented. So dynamically, they change the experience in the browser depending on the, uh, depending on the customer bandwidth. So if the bandwidth's low, they move to this more kind of slightly 2D view, it's still much better than the uh, previous uh, setup that most uh, car manufacturers had. Um, but it's, not as, it's obviously not as smooth. You've got this kind of just moving between the 2D views. So we're able to um, dynamically change the bandwidth based on that. And then we also needed to use uh, different uh, encoding, decoding, and transport methods uh, to, be able to, uh, to be able to suit the different bandwidth requirements and device requirements without the plugins. Um, so the real ask is, how can we meet the customer demand while um, minimizing the waste? So meeting the customer demand, deliver the same quality product um, allow it to be as customizable as it is in the other more immersive experiences. Um, and one of the actual asks from, uh, from Audi was to be able to load the, we'll talk about the technical details about this in a, in a moment, but be able to load the car configurator within less than 10 seconds. And Zero Light are getting closer to five seconds now, which is great. But there's some, there's some kind of pre-warming that you have to do for these uh, EC2 instances to be able to provide the car to the, uh, to the browser. So we'll talk about that in a little while. And then minimizing waste. Um, again, you, there's this pre-warming activity. You don't want to have to uh, have all this waste, all these expensive EC2 instances sitting there waiting for users to come online. You want to be able to be a bit more predictive about when users are going to come online. So talking a bit more generally about rendering in the cloud, we see lots of industries uh, leveraging rendering. Uh, there's the obvious ones. There's the visual effects and animation. And you've probably, if you've been to reInvent before, there's been many talks from kind of Hollywood kind of animation uh, companies talking about the way they spin up large render farms on, on AWS. Um, gaming, obviously, is another popular one. And actually, we're seeing quite a lot of interest in the manufacturing, architecture, uh, uh, engineering, and life sciences spaces as well. Uh, obviously, the Zero Light product really fits into the sales and marketing space. It's about providing a better user experience to the, uh, to the customers. So when we speak to customers of AWS, we, we get these kind of two requests that most customers say they need. And these are the kind of things you can't get when you're running an environment on premises. The ability to spin up thousands of cores on demand, um, the ability to spin up these huge rendering farms, uh, be able to just spin them up on demand, turn them off utility fashion. Um, you guys all at an AWS conference, I'm sure you hopefully understand that, that concept by now. I don't need to go into that in too much detail. And then a disposable infrastructure, the ability to have these project-based infrastructures that you can spin up for specific projects and dispose of them when you don't need them um, and be able to kind of replicate that in a consistent manner globally as well. So what does AWS offer to, uh, to help with these problems? Well, firstly, we can, in the sense here, you see the price point. Uh, we'll talk about this in a second now. You can get to this. But we, we can go from to about as little as one penny uh, per core hour on EC2. Um, we also can enable that project-based disposable infrastructure through tools like uh, standardization, like cloud formation and auto scaling and those kind of tools. Um, access to thousands of cores when needed. We don't have too many problems with that. Um, also, when you think about the wider Amazon ecosystem, one of the things with the storage uh, offerings we have means we're able to offer easier collaboration. So if you're collaborating with third parties or maybe you're in an, in an academic area and you want to share 
some share some studies with others. Those those storage platforms make it very easy for you to offload the data there, collaborate with others, and share between organizations very easily. Data has a sense of gravity to it, so you can bring your users and bring other users to that data, and they don't have to worry about that, that the big question, which is how do I transport that data? We can't all have snowmobiles. So, um, and the other thing we have is an ecosystem of software providers through the partner system. So we've got ISV partners like Zero Light. We've also got a marketplace full of products that enable you to do uh, certain jobs and workloads on, on AWS. And then from a compute perspective, we've got access to large memory offerings. So uh, we'll talk about the, uh, the, the EC2 instances that we have with GPUs shortly, but access to large memory configs it allows you to have these uh, 6K, 10K renders, these really high definition uh, renders. And as always, no upfront investment in infrastructure. The one thing that you really don't want when you've, you don't want to buy all this infrastructure upfront and then uh, only use it for that one period when you're doing your final render or whatever it may be. So one of the products that um, we see very popular in this space is Amazon EC2 Spot. So for those that aren't aware of Spot instances, uh, we have a, something called the EC2 Spot Market, and the Spot Market gives you the ability to spin up an EC2 instance, um, and you basically bid, you're bidding for unused capacity in AWS regions. So we have an X amount of unused capacity, and we offer that in a kind of, you can bid for that, it's a supply-demand game, basically. Um, the great thing about Spot is that we can, uh, we can sometimes, it's not guaranteed because the bid price fluctuates, fluctuates is a market, but we can get up to 90% discount on the on-demand price from EC2 through using Spot. So when you're thinking about spinning up these large thousands of core clusters to run these rendering workloads, Spot is the kind of perfect environment for that. There is one kind of huge caveat in that if, uh, if the demand changes and the spot price goes above your maximum bid price, um, we will just kind of pull that instance from under your feet. So it's no longer available. Um, but we do give you, uh, I think it's a one minute notification to tell you, so yeah, trying our best. Um, we never used to give you a notification at all, so we're getting better. Um, so, so that's a way for you to uh, to, to leverage this kind of huge amounts of compute at much lower cost for short periods of time. And for workloads like rendering, these ephemeral type workloads that you're spinning up for short periods and turn them off is perfect for that. One of the features of EC2 Spot is something called uh, Spot Fleet. Now, Spot Fleet allows you to define a target capacity um, for Spot. So before we release Spot Fleet, it was, you had to kind of pick this pool where you were, when you placed a bid on an EC2 instance, you would bid on a specific instance type in a specific availability zone in a specific region. Now that means that you have to kind of play around with the bid prices, bid in many different regions, and it was reasonably complex to, uh, to, to find the right price, or you could be bidding on one price, but it could have been cheaper in another uh, availability zone, and you weren't getting that benefit because, uh, because of that. So we simplified that with Spot Fleet. Now you can define a, a, how much capacity you want, a number of instances. You can define a, a min maximum bid price, so what is the maximum I'm willing to pay for each instance. And then you define something called a launch specification. And a, a launch specific a specification is a, a, a bunch of filters. So for example, I'm happy to use G2 8x large instances and C4 x large instances. I'm happy to use them in these availability zones in Asia, these availability zones in EU West, these availability zones in US West, um, uh, which Amazon machine image IDs you would use in each of those regions to spin up your instances. And it's pretty much the definition of what, what your minimum criteria is for you to be happy with that kind of resource. And then you have this IAM fleet role. So we use identity access management uh, roles for EC2 instances. And the EC2 instances in, in the spot fleet uh, need the iron role needs access to terminate those EC2 instances just the way it works the EC2 instance kind of calls the EC2 API to terminate so you just need an iron role there to uh, to to enable that to happen so spot fleet enables you to say I want 10,000 cores and I want them in 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 Asia e Europe and Americas maybe across all 14 regions I want them to be a minimum of uh, I want them to be a minimum of uh, a specific uh, processor type or a specific GPU type, 
Um, and we kind of try and maintain that capacity for you. So it's a fully automated process at that point. As long as the, the, your, we're, the spot price in one of those areas is below your maximum bid price and there's enough instances available, we'll try and maintain those 10,000 cores for you across the fleet. So it's like a managed kind of clustering uh, across spot. So that's really useful for uh, obviously any kind of ephemeral uh, workload where you don't necessarily worry too much about specific instances dropping off or, or not. So from an EC2 instance perspective, um, we've got two uh, GPU uh, instances. The first is the G2 instance, and this is our most popular instance for uh, 3D streaming. Uh, it's got up to four NVIDIA GPUs. Um, the largest 8x large instance has 16 uh, gigabytes of uh, GPU memory and uh, 6,000 CUDA cores. And it's also the uh, instance that powers our Amazon AppStream service. So if you were to uh, use Amazon AppStream, which allows you to uh, basically st stream pixels from a, a, a server-based instance, uh, the G2 instances are what are used under the hood there. We also more recently announced P2 instances. Now, these are uh, much more powerful. Uh, they're really our new instances for what we call accelerated computing. Uh, they have uh, 16 NVIDIA Tesla K80s, so they're much uh, more current uh, GPUs, and uh, up to 40,000 CUDA cores and 192 gig of uh, GPU memory. Um, we, we see a little bit of use for these for, 3D, uh, for VR rendering, um, but they're actually much more used for floating point calculations, deep learning, high performance computing, but I just wanted to uh, touch on them briefly because we do see some uses for uh, VR content rendering uh, as well. So, if you look at a typical uh, environment, we've got all these instances, GPU instances running, if we go back to the zero light story here, running uh, uh, for you, that users can access. Um, obviously, you've probably all seen this graph before. You don't want to have this fixed capacity because the first bit is, is really waste um, and you don't really need it. It's that waste you, you, you shouldn't have to pay for. Um, and then you have unhappy users in these peaks where, um, where, the, where there's no supply to meet, your, uh, to meet the demand. So what Zero Light do with AWS is they, they have this, uh, I wouldn't say it's a problem, but they have this, the, the way they have to load the, the 5 million polygon uh, render on the EC2 instance, you can't just auto scale an instance when a user logs on and wants to view the configurator because you want to get it to them in five seconds. So you need to pre-warm these instances. But again, we, don't want to, we want to minimize the waste. We don't want to have uh, too much waste. So ZeroLight use predictive uh, analytics and have algorithms that uh, predict when users uh, are potentially going to use the website. So they try and reduce the risk and reduce the, the risk of waste by using predictive analytics to, to try and estimate when users will access the website. And they use a, a mixture of instances that they can spin up in demand and load the model in. Um, and instances that are already uh, bootstrapped, but they're sitting there powered off, which have obviously a much shorter time to bring into, bring into service. And with that, I think I'll hand back to Francois to talk about what's coming next and how Zero Light are thinking of using AWS in the future to really kind of uh, make the experience, I'd say, more immersive, probably is a good word for that. So <laughs> Thanks. thank you. Perfect. So that was for the, the technical bit. So now I just want to take the, the last five, eight minutes before, we, maybe 10 minutes max, before we open for questions, uh, if you have questions. Um, I want to walk you through a little bit of what's going to come next. And when I say next, it's not like 10 years. It's really 2017. And some of those are already happening. Uh, so I have a few. And all those are based on uh, cloud and AWS and Zero Light Engine together. So one thing is, as you've seen at the beginning, is the uh, Alexa and Echo. So this is quite interesting because we started this with uh, AWS team uh, earlier this year, around uh, spring. Uh, we imported an Echo uh, because it was not even released in the UK yet at the time. And uh, it took our developer five days to develop the first skills to be able to talk to uh, the Pagani car. Then when we showed that to Audi, they said, this is really cool. And you know, Audi is very innovative, and they always want to try 
and be the first to do new and exciting things. So hands are the now contemplating developing that. So the, again, it's not an announcement, but we are looking at that with our D on how could we use Echo and an HMI device to change the way people configure cars, uh, whether it's online or maybe in VR. So again, stay put on that. We'll see what we can announce in hopefully in the next few weeks, okay, for Christmas. Um, there is one common point, I think, between Zero Light, what we do in the cloud and uh, in VR and Alexa. When you saw the announcement for this morning, with, uh, it's, it's quite interesting as well where, where it's all heading. Is that I think we we work with visualization on ways to remove the barrier between the product and the consumer by giving control and giving life to the product and giving control to the users, whether it's in VR, where you can drive the car, open the doors, or whether it's online, uh, the same behavior. And Alexa Echo is doing the same thing. They are giving you more natural ways to communicate and have more natural HMI with your product, whether it's to order something online or with the openness of the skills now to do anything you want. So that's one interesting bit. Another point uh, with the cloud is, and it's already working today, it just requires a big connection. Uh, we are going to announce a couple of months, a uh, customer doing that, uh, on how to use the cloud in the dealership directly for 4K configurator, so high quality 4K configurator. Today, on the cloud, in our configurator, we have a resolution of pretty much HD max, okay, more or less. So to go all the way to uh, ultra HD, it's through the web, it's a, it's a big step, but we can do it today with Amazon Web Services once you have a good connection. It's a really, really big advantage for OEMs because it removes the barrier of having to install hardware in the dealership. And again, hence, let's leave this problem to Amazon and let them solve that and just tell your dealer, buy a 4K screen, plug your connection, and you're all set. You're gonna have a nice, high quality uh, interactivity and experience, and we're gonna update your experience overnight, instantly, anytime. You don't have to do anything. And, uh, and you'd pay per the usage, okay? So it's really win-win. So that's coming uh, as well. So this is what we call cloud retail solution at zero light. Another thing which is going to get bigger and bigger is mobile VR. Whether it's Cardboard, Daydream, uh, Gear VR, we are working more and more to have the ability to take that experience from the cloud uh, to, the, uh, to the immersive. And we can sync the configurator to your mobile VR device through the cloud. So you just get this IQ code, okay, QR code, and uh, you sync it, and then when you change the configuration online, you tap it and you have it on your, on your device. So that's the beginning of the, uh, the experience, but you're gonna see more and more with the cloud and, and with, with better ability to, uh, to transfer data, uh, more interactive experiences there. Another thing which is interesting, again, back to the ability to remove the barrier between the product and the consumer, this, so what you see here, it's obviously an Audi branded website, but this is more us to uh, playing with that, okay? So it's zero light playing with that. We share that with Audi, of course, but this is not uh, an Audi uh, live project yet. What you see here is no more button. So you remove those buttons. The first video you showed was 3D configurator in a, you know, in a close of a 2D UI. So it's still, two words together, but 3D doesn't need those buttons anymore. What you can have is complete interactive UI directly on the car. So when you arrive on the OEM website, you could see the car directly and you could interact with the car, you could turn around and the product is the star. And again, it could be a car or it could be anything else. It could be a, uh, you know, uh, Apple Watch for instance, okay? Uh, if you wanna configure the watch. Uh, or any other watch or any other white good device. Big data, so what we discussed earlier and data mining is giving us huge opportunity to create customization and personalize your experience. So if you take the example of Amazon, each of us here, we all have, I mean, most of us, I guess, have an Amazon account. Every homepage looks different. We don't have the same one because Amazon is using your pattern, our pattern, our behavior of 
consumption and shopping habits. And they give us product and recommendation that they think might be useful for us and interesting for us. And as, as a consumer, I actually like it. It's, uh, um, it's, it's very interesting. It should be the same for the automotive. Today, when you go to an OEM website, we all have the same page, but we don't all have the same taste. Taste, sorry. So when you personalize your car, you create your own product, okay? So you remove a bit this barrier of uh, imposing a product to someone. You give the user the ability to create the products that he wants to create. And we should be able to have the ability to give the user the page and the recommendation that will fit his um, taste as well. We can do it today. The other thing, so for instance, you have this user, or you have that user, or you have me here, we will have different page. And all the options you see on the page, the recommendations, and also the way to see every feature will come there. So for instance, when you're in automotive, saying the upsell goes on um, uh, all the options you buy for the car. But not every option is a visual option. But every single option impacts the car somehow and your experience. If it's a change of technology in the brake, we can come up with videos and real-time information to show you the impact of having better brakes. You're going to stop your car faster. If it's uh, maybe a different emission system, we can show you the impact on the environment and maybe how the engine is working inside in 3D. So we can show every single option in 3D. If it's either directly the option and the change on the car or the impact of the option. The very last video of today before we open for question is a Pagani video. And what you're gonna see here, so I have to explain is you're going to see the, the car driving, okay, which is where we're going next as well. You're going to see more and more car moving, and car because we're in automotive, but could be again something else. What you'll see in that video is real-time content production. So this car, this video can be produced in real time for any configuration you do. It's not something you give to an agency and then they come back and they give you an invoice and here is your nice video. This is something that the consumer can produce himself on the web. So we're, going on, we're working at the right on solutions to help you be your own director for your own vi videos as well when you configure the car. And all this is possible because you have real time online and with uh, things such as Amazon Web Services and uh, especially the uh, EC2, uh, G2 instances. Again, everything is uh, digital in the video and there is no retouch on the production. There is no post-production. You shot in real time, and you just have predefined scene you put together. And with that, uh, we'll open it for question. Uh, Want to come back maybe, uh, help me on the technical question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>